of them together and they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language and they were astounded and amazed saying look are it all these people speaking Galileans how come they speak our language that was the power of the Holy Ghost how is it that we hear them each of them in our own native language every single person in that place could hear the Galileans the Jewish people now suddenly speaking their language it was an outbreak of the and this didn't happen because God decided to just do that kind of a revival. People were in earnest expectation. People were prepared for the move. People were willing to have an impact. People were ready and prepared to receive that which God had in that season. It begins with you. It begins with me. It begins with all of us coming together and making a decision that in this season we want to have an impact of the Holy Spirit. One thing that is so significant in any, any kind of revival history has ever recorded was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is no revival that ever has been recorded without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It means we cannot have a true revival without the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is the catalyst for revival. If we truly want to have a revival that causes us to pray like Sister Coco prayed this morning. Yeah. Crying her heart out and crying to God for the children of this community. Yeah. I saw her pray in ways that she's never prayed before yeah. on this altar. Because there is a move of God. There is a revival. There is a passionate cry out of God's people for revival. When you start to worship, your worship becomes different because you are not worshiping from the flesh. The spirit takes over and now you are ministering from the unction of the Holy Spirit. It is time to give the Holy Spirit access. I tell you the church of Jesus is non-existent in many places. What we call church is actually no church at all because there is no room for the Holy Spirit. Any church without the Holy Spirit is not a church. Any church where the Holy Spirit is silenced, the Holy Spirit has no say. It's a human organization. It is not a church of Jesus Christ because the church was birthed out in this scripture that we read. This was when the church truly got birthed out. When the Holy Spirit came. So if the church has no Holy Spirit, that is no church. That is a gathering of people. That is a secular gathering. And secular means without God. And that is why we had to read the book of Exodus. For those of you who came into the building on Friday. And those of you that even joined in. You remember what we read in Exodus? I, I, I think we should read that again. Because some of us need to get this in our spirit. Reason why you would cry. And, 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 and declare from the depths of your heart, I want you, Holy Spirit. I need you. I can do nothing without you. Look at the church of Jesus Christ today. People come to church because they want the pastor's anointing. People come to church because they want the pastor's miracle. And the pastor is also in the pulpit because he wants the church member's money. We are both deceiving ourselves. You are here for my anointing. I'm here for your money. That is the church we have. So the one who has a big purse gets the biggest prophecy. That is the church. You are here because you believe the power of miracles and healing and, and deliverance and all these things is in the pastor. So I'm going to come and take some of that and walk away once I get what I want. And the pastor is also being a trickster. Tricking you with all kinds of prophecies so he can collect your money. That is what the church of Jesus has been reduced to. You are here for something from me. I'm here for something from you. And God is not here at all. That is what the church has become. Others are here for boyfriends. Some are here for girlfriends. Everybody is in the church of Jesus Christ for something but not God. We are here for all other things, but not God. We 
are not here for God. Some of us come to church because we think church is a modeling contest. I have a new shoe. I have new clothes. I have to come and show it off. No. Look at what the Bible says in Exodus 33. Maybe that will help somebody this morning. Hallelujah. If we truly want to encounter God, if we truly revere God. Bible says God is in the building. Let the whole earth be silent before him. Do you know what that means? It means when I enter into this building, I know it is time with God. And so I don't take that for granted. I don't just loiter and walk around in all kinds of disobedience. When I'm here for business, I'm here because God is in the building. And the Bible says, let the whole earth remain silent before him. All activity must cease. All the focus must be on God. You have no idea how my spirit grieves when in the midst of the service people are just loitering around. And I'm like, why did you come here? You don't even know why you are here. You're so lost. That is why your life is still in disorder because you don't reverence God. The things of God don't matter to you. Jesus, look at Mary and Martha. He said, Mary has made a right choice. You chose to cook when Christ was present. And you thought you were doing it for Christ. No. When I'm sitting and preaching the word, that is paramount. Because God is even subject. God stops his activities when his word is being preached. That is what the Bible says. Even God. Stops all other things and pay attention to his word. Bible says God has lifted up his word above himself. Do you understand that? And you have the audacity to do any other thing but pay no attention to the word of God? And you think things in your life are going to turn around for good? When you have ignored the weightier things, Bible calls it. The weightier things. The heavy things, the most important things, you've ignored it. They mean nothing to you. If I look at it, as if we, we, with all that kind of attitude, things are working. Keep living. Because life has a way of catching up to you. You think you're slick. You think you're smart. You think you're getting away with everything. Things are still working. I tell you what, the Tower of Babel was being built beautifully. It seems it was working out. They finished the first floor. They finished the third floor. They finished the fourth floor. They looked at it. They were like, we're making progress. But one day God shows up and pulls everything apart. When in the middle of their mid success, they felt everything was great. So the fact that things are working doesn't mean that God is in the midst of it. That's why the Bible says daily, I examine myself, examine your heart. Whether you are living for God, you are living in the standard of God or you're doing your own thing, examine your heart. Glory to Jesus. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 33. What verse did we read? We started from one, read a few verses and jumped to 15. Look at what the Bible says. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said, go, live here. You and these people, you brought out from the land of Egypt. I didn't bring them, you brought them. Because that's the way their mind tells them now. Because you remember, you read even the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. Is that what the Bible says? It says, remember the Lord thy God. For it is him that giveth thee power to make wealth. Sometimes after we get a wealth, we now begin to make people, you know, I'm smart. I know how to make good financial decisions. Soon we forget that it was God that gave you the power to make wealth. We forget. Many times God will tell them, remember, for I am the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. But here, he's telling Moses, Moses, you know what? You and this renegades have come to a place of realizing that I don't mean anything to you. So you know what? You and these people, you brought out of Egypt. I didn't bring them. Because that's the way they're behaving. They're behaving like I had no plan. I had no place in their life in their coming out of Egypt. So he says you and these people. Now you know very well that Moses was always in right standing with God. But sometimes the people you hang out with has a way of impacting your own life. God didn't just address the people. He addressed Moses too. He said you and your people go with them. Go with them. 
He says, the people you brought out of the land of Egypt, how dare you even receive such a statement that I brought? I want to take the credit? No, I'm not. He says, take them to the promised land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one that promised, but you think you, you can make it without me. Go with them. And you know what? Because I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you go, I will give it to you, and I'll give it to the people. Look at the next verse. It's so scary when God begins to speak a certain way to you. I will send an angel. You go, I, I'm going to hook you up. I will send you an angel ahead of you. And that angel, I will tell him to cast out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Everything that will come against you, I will give you an angel to fight them. Number three. He says, and eventually, I want you to go to a land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go with you. Because, and I want you to know the reason why I'm not going to go with you. Because you are stiff-necked people. Otherwise, if I hang out with you guys in your stiff-neckedness, I will kill you guys one by one. That's the only reason. I love you too much. I don't want to kill you. Just you're on your own. He says, go. I'm not going to go with you. Now, a good number of us will be like, well, this is not too bad. God is giving me blessings. The only thing is that he's not going to be around. He's giving me the house. He's giving me the car. He's giving me a great job. He says, I should go have it all. He's just not going to go with me. Well, he even has given us an angel. So the future looks good. A good number of us will take this and run with it. But I don't want God's staff without God. I don't want to have any of God's staff without God. I don't want the creature without the creator. Is somebody understanding me? I want the creator and I want the creature. And you know what? I want the creator even if I don't get to have the creature. The reason being that if I have the creator... I already have the creature. You know, when I read a scripture that says that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy at his right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. A good number of people don't understand why the Bible says at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. <clears throat> pleasures are the things that brings joy to your heart. Good marriage, good children being raised, a good career, a good job. All the great things we ask it. Bible says all those pleasures are at his right hand. A good number of people don't understand even why we need to pray in the name of Jesus. Because we don't understand that those pleasures at the right hand is the same place where Jesus is sitting. That is why he says if you want any of this stuff on his right hand where I sit, whenever you pray, pray in my name. Because those requests normally come to me. Because I'm in charge of his right hand. So here you are, you don't want to have any relationship with Jesus, but you want staff at the right hand. Bible says anyone that doesn't come into the house from the door, but uses any other entrance, whether window, roof, wherever you're a thief. And the Bible says when a thief is caught, he must be made to return, refund sevenfold. I'm just trying to help you that anything you get in the wrong way, a time is going to come where you're going to refund it all. And not just refund it all, all the profit and all the accumulation you've made out of it. If you know the principle of restitution, you're going to bring it all back. You remember the man that said, anybody that I've ever stolen money from, Jesus, I'm going to return it and also add on to it. It's a principle of restitution. It means that even though you've done it the wrong way all this while, God has a way of stripping it all from you. Because you did it. Not coming through the door, but coming through the window. So again, we think, well, we can do it. We don't need Christ. We don't need his word. We don't need his principles. We're going to do it. So God gives Moses and all these people this proposal. But look at what Moses says in verse 50. Because a good number of us 
will just jump at this proposal and run with it. But Moses is a smart man. Reason why the Bible says he knew the ways of God. The people of Israel only knew the works of God. Because they only wanted a miracle. The works of God. Why are we thirsty? God, we need water. Moses, knowing the ways of God, goes to God. God says, take a rod, strike the rock, and water will come. Or speak to the rod, water will come. Of course, out of his anger, he strikes the rod. They, they go to God. They go to Moses. We hungry. No food in the wilderness. Moses goes to God. God says, well, I'm going to send manna and quails from heaven. Heavenly bread and heavenly chicken. I'm going to bring it down for the children of Israel. But make sure when they gather, they must trust me that I'm the God that brought it today. I will bring it tomorrow. Make sure they don't gather enough for tomorrow. They should only gather for today. Their lack of faith in God causes them to gather too much. Enough for tomorrow. Enough for Tuesday. Enough for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Next month. By the time they woke up, all of it was rotten. Because the provisions of God yesterday is totally different from his provision today. Because they don't understand that God, Bible says, his messes are new every day. He does new things. God is too loaded to repeat himself. He's too loaded. He says, behold, I do a new thing. The former things I do no more. He says, behold, can't you see it? It springs forth. It's a new thing. That is why God doesn't even consult your yesterday to determine your tomorrow. For those of us that are still living in the past that God is not forgiving us because we did some stuff yesterday, he doesn't consult that. He puts all that in his sea of forgetfulness. That is what the Bible says. Men will do what men do. Men remember. And so they act based on what they remember. But not with God. That is why the Bible says God is not like man. But look at what Moses says in verse 15. He says, if your presence does not go with us, don't make us go from here. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm not even going to take one step. If your presence is not going to go with us. In fact, we're not making any move until you agree that you're going to go with us. We hear all this good stuff. You're bringing us to a land flowing with milk and honey. You're giving us all these angels that are going to fight all these Jebusites, Hittites, Amorites, defeat all the enemies that are going to come along the way. But that is still not enough without you. Do you understand nothing is enough without God? Can somebody understand that? That nothing is enough without God. That is why the richest people in the world today are still not happy. That is why people with tens of cars are not happy. Hundreds of homes are not happy. Beautiful family, beautiful children, they're still not happy. They have a job that pays them a million dollars a week. They're still not happy. That is why the rich and famous are still committing suicide. Because everything without God is dung. That is what Paul says. He says, everything I have ever acquired, if it is without God, it is dung. It is garbage. So the Bible says, how can you gain the whole world? Have everything in this world without God. How could you? Mm. So Moses said, I hear you. But no, we're not taking any step without you. All these things are awesome. They are beautiful. We really would love to have it, but not without you. Look at verse 16. So Moses says, how will it be known that I, <laughs> and I love this, you call them my people, but I needed to know your people. He says, how can I and your people <laughs> have found favor in your sight unless you go? Because these guys are so stubborn, God calls them Moses' people. Moses to call them God's people. Nobody wants to own them. <laughs> he says, how will it be known that I and your people have found favor in your sight? How? I have all the houses, but that doesn't mean I have favor with you. I have the job that pays me six figure. It doesn't mean I have favor with you. We so corrupt a generation of believers that we replace the true presence of God with material things. So if I have some money, it means God is blessing me. 
if I have a good job, it means God is with me. And those who do not have those money and those good jobs, they feel intimidated. They feel God has neglected them. The presence of God is not measured by material things. God is not physical. God is not material. God is a spirit. And the Bible says those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Glory to God. So how dare you judge the manifestation of the presence of God by material things. See how the Lord is blessing them and I got nothing. No, you got something they are so desperately in need of. It is called the presence of God. You carry the presence of God. You might not have all the material things they have, but you carry the presence of God. You have God on your side. And if you have God on your side, you have the majority on your side. John Knox said, God, give me England, else I die. Give me England. I want your heart. There are things going on in the community that causes God to bleed. And God is calling a church that will rise up so that the bleeding in the heart of God will stop. Here we are. We come to church. We don't care about the things that break the heart of God. We don't understand that when the youth in the community are sold to drugs and opioid and marijuana and all this crazy that's going on in the community, it is a youth disaster that is waiting to erupt and it breaks the heart of God but breaks nobody's heart in the church we are more concerned about how we can get a second car how we can get a third car how I can increase my income when God is looking to fill his house with people that are washed by the blood people that are delivered by the blood people that are born again Holy Ghost feel that will lift up their hands and worship God nobody nobody's concerned about it things of God anymore. We are so self-centered. It is all about us. It is all about us. Nothing about a kingdom. Nothing about a kingdom inspires us anymore. But change is coming. And it starts with the remnants. It doesn't have to start with 100 people. Remnants. One person, two people that are ready for change in the lives of God's people. Change that comes right into the community. Just a handful of people that are ready. Moses said, how will it be done? That I and your people have found favor in your sight. Unless, unless, unless we have more cars. Unless we have a good job. What distinguishes us from the people of the world? Because you know what? The cars that makes you feel God loves you more, there are people who have, who have nothing to do with God, who have tens of cars more than you have. And if that is a way to judge whether God is with you, I tell you, the unbelievers with ten cars have more God than you. Some of you have great jobs. And because of that, you come to church. Nobody can talk to you. You have chips over your shoulder. You feel you're better than everybody else. Because you got some 10000 stored up in your savings account. $10,000. And nobody can talk to you. And so you have people that are so sophisticated, even in their dressing. And people like Elon Musk will just wear a simple t-shirt that costs 10 bucks. We're so bankrupt, we have to put on layers of clothes to make us look expensive. That is how bankrupt we've become. I used to look at Steve Jobs, he barely puts on a belt. He would just have a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and some sneakers, which might possibly cost 40 bucks. It's only the poor that are buying sneakers of $300 just to look, oh God, help us. That is how corrupt we become. Hallelujah. Kingdom mindset. Moses of God, if you're not going, forget about it. We're not moving. We're not going anywhere. We desire you. We don't want to go anywhere where God is not. We want to be in your environment. We want to hang out with you. We want to be with you. There is nothing about hanging out with God. When Jesus was leaving, he said, it's expedient that I leave. If not, the Holy Spirit will not come. And Holy Spirit in the Greek word paraclete simply means the same of another. Or another of the same. 
It means Jesus, just as Jesus was with you and to you, the Holy Spirit will be with you and also to you. What did Jesus do when he was here? He did a lot of things for people. He did a lot of things for the disciples. He says the same way I was a blessing to them, if you truly allow the Holy Spirit to come, he will do the same thing for you. Jesus was a man that empathized. I'm just imagining he coming into the house of Lazarus, his best friend. He's dead. He had a power to raise him up, but the Bible says he wept. It's called empathy. It means if you're going through stuff, friends are going to come in the season where you're going through, what you're going through, maybe you've lost a dear one, whatever the case, folks are going to come. They're going to spend some time with you, but the truth is that they're not going to be at your home forever. A time is going to come, everybody. And this is the reality. It is the reality. A day is going to come, I'm going to die, you're going to die, we're all going to die. And guess what? When that happens, everybody is going to come home. Everybody is going to be sad. Everybody is going to weep. Folks are going to come out of state. They're going to spend time at home. Folks are going to sit down and plan your funeral. They're going to be at a funeral. They're going to be at a barrier. But I tell you what, it's not going to be too long. They're going to have something called repass. And if you are from Africa, our repass is elaborate. We dance. Just after coming from the cemetery. And you'll be like, Really? You were just crying over me because you'll be out there looking at what we're doing. You were just crying over me and now you guys are eating steak, chicken, and dancing. That is the reality. Life still got to go on. Folks are going to do that. On Sunday evening after the memorial service, those family members that came for the funeral are going to be driving back. They love you. They came to cry. But Monday is coming. They got to go back home and get ready for work. Everybody that has something to say at your funeral will soon forget about you. They wouldn't even remember you once upon a time existed. They will go on with your life as if nothing has ever happened. But I love this because check this out. Bible says he will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit. When everybody is gone, he's going to be right there. And you are busy developing relationship with people that don't want to have that level of relationship with you. I want to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit who would never break the covenant of relationship. I want to build that relationship. It's the reason why when everybody goes, we begin to complain. Because the one we truly need, we have not taken the time to build relationship with God is calling us to a new place. He's calling us. That is the distinction between Moses and the people. When at that time they cried out, he didn't have to cry because he had a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He, what you guys say, oh, you know, throwing tantrums and all that, it, it might be just a word. Water, come out! And all of you, millions of you, you will be silenced. He wasn't desperate. He was not depressed. When they were depressed, he didn't feel like giving up and walking on God. Whilst everybody was throwing their hands in this place, he was calm because he knew the ways of God. So he says, how is it going to be? No, how are people going to distinguish us? Because the cars we have, they also have it. The job we do, we actually work with them from the same office. How are we truly going to be standing out and be different from the people of the world? Isn't it because of your presence? And you tell me you're not coming with us? Amen? You tell us you're not coming with us. If you're on Zoom, I want you to do one thing that is going to bless you. Type it out and say, Lord, I want you to come with me. Type it out. If you're in the building, declare it. Lord, I want you to come with me. You see, this is where it gets interesting. Because if you truly want the Lord to come with you, you know there are places you go to you don't want God to come with you. Because of what you do in those places. I'm just trying to help somebody overcome sin. If you truly want God to come with you to everywhere you go, that is the way you break the back of sin. Because you know if you're going to go hang out and do some ugly stuff with so, some friends of yours, you're not going to say God come with me because God is not going to come. The Bible says that sin will not dwell in the presence of God. There are certain places you're going to go, you're like, God wait for me, I'll be right back. 
I will be right back. Truly? He says, I would never leave you nor forsake you. You know, you're going to go out there and drink your head off. And you want God to come with you. You know, you're going to go there and smoke your brains out. And you're like, God, come with me. No. You know, you're going to go out there and mess around with that girl, that boy. And you're like, God, come with me. Really? You want him to watch that? Really? You want God to see that? And you're not scared. Doing that, knowing very well that, well, even though the lights are off, God sees through the dark. It is because we don't recognize the presence of God. We don't understand that God sees all things. So we think we could do some of these things and get away with because God doesn't see. God is not blind. He sees it. And I love this man. He says, God, how are the people going to distinguish us from the people of the world? Isn't it because of your presence? He poses that question to God. The only way they're going to see that distinction between us and them is because your presence is with us. Oh, yeah. That's the only thing. The presence. Just the presence. Just the presence. I don't know how many of you feel desire the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just the presence. Just the presence. And I wanted to declare it. All I desire is the presence. If you're on Facebook. All I desire is the presence of the Lord. That is all I desire. We're chasing after the wind. We're chasing after the wrong things. Now if God is coming. And I, I, I kind of feel that sometimes I think the problem is because we don't understand the Bible. You know, Pastor Helen, Bible says everything in this earth belongs to God. He owns it all. Whether it's donkeys, his horses, whatever it is, he owns it all. What that simply means is that if I need any of these stuff, I must go to the owner and get it from him. So what makes you think that you're going to get this stuff without the owner's approval? And a good number of us are getting it anyway without his approval. You know how we buy stuff off the truck? You know the stuff they sell? You know, the, recently a guy told me he's selling a, a fridge. And he said, oh, give me $500 and you got this brand new fridge. Beautiful fridge. Double door. You know, he had uh a third door and i i looked at it and i'm like where did you get this from he said oh don't worry i make i'm giving you a deal you 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 get it a deal i said what are you talking about and i i googled the fridge the model number everything the fridge is about three thousand five hundred dollars brand new still in the box he said sir five hundred dollars you want it right now you got it and i said how are you able to sell this five hundred dollars are you CS? Are you Home Depot? What are you? Who are you? Oh, come on. You don't know things fall off the truck sometimes and, you know, fall off. Where? What are you talking about? But if you're getting this stuff without God, you are buying stuff off the truck. And the cops are still going to come investigate and they're going to track and find where that product is. And when they come and they realize that you were the one that got it, not only would they retrieve it, take it away from you, you might end up in jail. You might get in prison. I'm trying to help somebody understand why sometimes we find ourselves in situations and places and we, figure, we can't figure out what even brought us here. Choices we make without God. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So he said, I'm not going to do it without you because I know how these things are going to unfold when I do stuff without you. Look at verse 17. The Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing you have asked for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. God changed his mind pretty much. He said, I wasn't going to go. Moses said, well, you know, if you don't go, your people. Your people. I tell you what, when you hand over things to God, it brings God right into it. Moses now calls the people God's people. He didn't own them. When you own things, God walks away because he, you are just telling God, I can do it without you. 
I want to take the wheels. But when you say, God, I want to sit on a passenger seat and I hand over the wheels to you, it brings God right back into that situation. And some of you are holding on to stuff. You have no clue how to handle it, how to manage it. And God is telling you this morning, let it go. Release it. Hand it over to me and I will handle it for you. Hallelujah. I will handle it for you. Glory to God. Because some of us think we could do it better and up till now, we're still struggling. And God says, let it go. Let it go. Tell somebody, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And speak to yourself, let it go. You got to let it go. That is the only way you're going to get the hand of God in that situation. And like I said, it starts off with true repentance. Look at the book of Psalm 51. Let me show you how true repentance looks like. The book of Psalm 51. We know the backdrop to this story. Uh, the man of God goes into the house of David and says, there was a man that had a lot of sheep. And in his neighborhood, there was another man who had only one sheep. And then it was Christmas. And they needed a sheep to be killed for dinner. In the house of the man who had a lot of sheep. And the man said, you know what? I am not ready to sacrifice any of my sheep. Go to my neighbor's house. And that one sheep he has, bring it home. Let us kill it. And we will eat it without him. You think that is bad? When David heard that, he said, this is a wicked man. This man must be arrested and thrown into jail. And if possible, given the capital punishment. The prophet of God said, Really? That's what you recommend for this man's crime? Well, sir, you are that man. Because you have many wives. Your neighbor who has only one wife, you have taken his wife. The moment David heard that, and a good number of us are hearing the word of God today, but the key thing is that what you are hearing, does it break your heart? Does it cause you to be convicted in your heart of something you are doing that is hurting another man, another woman? Something you are doing that is breaking the heart of God. Is it really impacting your heart? The Bible says the moment David heard that, he ran straight into the place of seeking forgiveness. And that is what we are about to read in Psalm 51. That is what happened to David and the things David had to say. Look at what he said. He said, be gracious to me. He went to God. He said, God, please be gracious to me. According to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion. He said, God, please blot out my rebellion. He calls it by name what he did. He calls what he did as a rebellion. He said, God, please blot it out. Look at the next verse. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Let's keep going. For I am conscious. You know how sometimes we are walking in sin and for a second we behave as if we have dementia. We don't remember the sin we committed. He says, I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Not sometimes. If you are really being led by the spirit of God, you cannot be walking in a spirit and walking in sin at the same time. It is called bipolar. Because you're doing two things at the same time. You cannot be walking in a spirit and still walking in the flesh at the same time. He says, because I'm a man of the spirit, every time I wake up, that sin nature is right in front of me. I cannot ignore it. I cannot pretend it doesn't exist. He says, I am conscious of it. And then verse 4, he says, against you, you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. He said, God, in case you brought me to court, you will be justified. I have no defense. I have no alibi. I have no witness to stand with me. I have nothing in my defense. Because what I did, I was totally and completely wrong. I want you to have a good picture of true repentance. And there is no revival that is coming into our lives without true repentance. No. No. We can 
cannot hold sin in one hand and trust God for a move of the spirit. No, you got to let go of this one so that you can get God completely. Because he says, my glory, I will share with no sin. I will share with no man. I will share with nothing else going on in your life. God is not looking for a visitation. He wants to have custody. He wants to have a full custody. Some of us come to church on Sundays just to visit God. I'm here to give God a visit. He doesn't need a visit. He wants a relationship. Hallelujah. And so sometimes we, we treat God as that family member that once in a while we go to you know, visit and check out how he's doing. And so you could go three months without coming to church or having anything to do with God, reading your Bible, studying the Bible, praying to God, doing none of those things that a true believer is supposed to do. Once in a while, when you remember, and sometimes when you're going through stuff, that you remember there is a God that answers needs. And you hang on in his circles for a while until he answers your need. And then you take off again until the next challenge shows up. I tell you, there is so much wickedness in the world today. I heard a story of a young man that was asked. He had been praying and fasting. And he's been praying and fasting and telling God, God, I need a move. I need a change in my life. There are things in my life that God, I needed to come through for me. He had a list of stuff he was seeking from God. And then on the last day of his fast, an angel showed up. And he called his pastor. I said, Pastor, you won't believe it. In my revelation today, an angel showed up in this 21 days of fasting. And the angel asked me, what do you need? And I woke up. I didn't know what to tell the angel. Then the pastor asked him, so what did, you, what did you tell the angel? He said, nothing. So what are you going to tell the angel if the angel showed up again? He said, I, I don't know. He said, why don't you know? He said, because the angel told me that uh, whatever you ask, God is going to do it for you. But God will do double for your neighbor. Whatever God gives to you, God is going to do double for your neighbor. And so he thought of it. And the next time the angel came, he had an answer. Because he hated his neighbor. He didn't like the neighbor. How come God is going to give my neighbor double what God is going to give me? But you've been praying. You've been seeking the face of God. You've been asking God for stuff. And now the angel has come to take your request up unto God. And you, you are still wondering and you know, trying to figure out what I'm going to ask God. So pastor said, so this time, what did you tell the angel? He said, pastor, you know, this clause of my neighbor getting double, you know, I don't talk to that guy. He's a mean guy. I don't like him. So you know what? I just told the angel that I want blindness of one eye. <laughs> so if I get blind in one eye, my neighbor will get double blindness. <laughs> Wickedness in high places. I'm talking about the state of our hearts sometimes. It might sound funny. But do you realize that your blessing is never complete until people in and around your life becomes impacted by your blessings? Yeah. Why would you feel good about yourself because you feel you're better than everybody else? No. My blessing can never be complete until everybody in my community is impacted by my blessing. It's just like you coming around and say, I'm praising God. And you are upset because the keyboardist didn't play your key. He didn't play your son. didn't play whatever you wanted. It wasn't for you. That praise wasn't for you. So how dare you complain? I, I didn't get my number today. The music wasn't what I was expecting. It didn't go the way I wanted it. It wasn't for you. David said, you know what, I recognize what I did wrong. Because I truly want to have a real revival. And I know I cannot have the true revival of God whilst I'm still living in sin and deception, deceiving God. Bible makes very clear that God cannot be mocked. You cannot deceive God. In fact, when you think you're deceiving God, you're deceiving yourself. 
So look at what he says. He says, against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right. When you pass sentence, you are blameless when you judge. Let's keep reading. Verse number five. Indeed, I was, not I am. I was guilty when I was born. Mm -hmm. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. I've always told you that when we get born, we don't only inherit or get the good genes, the good look and all the beautiful skin pigmentation of our parents. We also take on their sin nature. And David recognized the source of his weakness. He says, this thing didn't just happen because I had an affair. It's been right there from birth. And if you don't deliver me, no therapy will deliver me. If you don't break this hold in my life, no counseling of human beings will change it. He goes right to the root. He says, it's a root. Glory to God. And so we must be able to discover the root of our challenges. You know how many programs you've been through, how many steps you've learned, and you go right back. Because Bible says, he who the seven steps shall set free is free indeed. Seven steps, eight steps program, counseling, deliverance. No, Bible says, he who the son, the son shall set free is free indeed. Every other freedom is a fake freedom. He says, surely I know God, you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. You see, integrity mustn't be superficial. You know how sometimes you could see people, the way even they walk, you could smell the presence of God around them. But that is not really the presence of God. <laughs> no, seriously. You could enter into an auditorium and have somebody strike a chord right there and that chord will sound like the Holy Spirit just entered a room don't be deceived because that brother is not born again he doesn't have the spirit so the fact that he, he, he strike a chord on the keyboard and you had goosebumps on your body and suddenly you feel no He said, God, purify me with hyssop. This is his cry. Purify me with hyssop. And I will be clean. Wash me and I will be white than snow. It is only God that can cleanse us, nothing else. That is why folks will come to a pastor and complain, that sister is doing ugly, that one is doing nasty, that one is... If the word from the pulpit can't change you, nothing can change you. And I tell you what, if you are listening to the word that comes out of the pulpit, your marriage doesn't need extra counseling. Because if the word coming from the pulpit is complete enough, Bible says the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in my Lord. And I'm complete in him. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing to be found. All I need is in him. So if I'm receiving the word, I'm embracing the word. I'm doing everything the word is telling me to do. I got to be complete in him. Everything I need is in the word. Everything I would ever need is in the word. There is nothing I can seek that is outside the word. Even God is dependent on his word. Because he has lifted up the word above himself. He is subject. A good number of us want to manipulate God and make God do something that is outside the word. God will not do anything outside the word because even God he is limited to what he's able to do based on the word because he's subject to the word he lifted the word above himself so how dare you think if I can only sow five hundred dollars I can provoke the hand of God and still live in sin today there are all kinds of anointing folks go by anointing of favor anointing oil of um, God has become so cheap you want to buy God's power, his anointing with 500. It reminds me of that young man that went to the disciples in the book of Isaiah and said, we see you do miracles. How about take this money and give us some? Some. No, you can't buy the anointing. No. 
You must have a clean vessel. There must be a clean vessel. We are living in a dispensation where we are overstretching the message on grace and make believe that it's okay to live in sin and the power of God is still active. Once saved, forever saved. It doesn't matter the life you live after you get born again. The Bible says that in every house there are all kinds of vessels. Vessels made of wood. Vessels made of clay. Vessels made of uh, plate. Vessels made of uh, all kinds. But what did I know? Pastor Helen, in those days, when there is Christmas, there were special plates grandma would bring out. Those plates with those flowery colored things around it. Oh, gold trim. Those plates are not used every Sunday. They are not used every day. Yeah. And those plates, kids don't eat in them. Because you cannot be trusted. Even the washing and preparation and cleaning them and making them ready for the event, you cannot be trusted with them. Just the cleaning, not the use, the cleaning. So what makes you think that you are going to be optimized in the things of God when you are not a vessel unto honor? Because the Bible makes a distinction, vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. So what vessel do we want to become? Look at verse number 8. Let's read on. I'm going to finish soon. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. I love this because bones in the Bible refers to your spirit. Anytime you hear the word bones in the Bible, it's a reference to your spirit. You read a book of uh, Deuteronomy uh, 22 verse 8 and 9. Bible says, do not uh, plow. He was speaking to the children of Israel who were primarily agricultural Base. It says, do not plow with an ass and a donkey. Now, if you look at them physically on the outside, they all look the same. But their bone structure is totally different. He was talking about business engagement. That you cannot mix two people who do not have the same spirit. He took Ezekiel to the valley of bones. And he asked, will these bones live? Translation, Will these dead people who are dead, dried up and gone, would their spirit come back into their bodies again? So he was talking about bone, but in essence, he was talking about the spirit of people that were dead. Because that didn't happen until he called the north, the south, the east, and the west wind, which was their spirit back into them. So anytime we see bone, Bible is talking about what spirit. And so he says, you know what? Walking in sin has crushed my bones. You cannot feel right in your spirit when you're walking in sin. He was not just talking about his body. He's talking about his spirit man. You know how sometimes you come to church and you just can't connect with what is going on? Because sin is present in your life. And until you defeat and break the hold of sin, you cannot just experience the joy of the Lord. Let's go on. He says, let me hear joy. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. That was his cry. He said, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Just like the bones within me. Verse number 11, he says what? <clears throat> he says, do not banish me from your presence. Take note. I've been talking the whole of this morning about the presence of the Lord. Remember the scripture we read in Exodus 33? The Lord says, I'm taking you to the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you an angel that will deal with all the Amalekites, the Jebusites, the Amorites. And so Moses, you and your people go, but I would not go with you. And Moses said, come again. <laughs> Say what? You're giving us all this stuff without you. Moses said, no. I don't want your stuff without you. I would rather take you and forgo your stuff. Because when I have you, I got your stuff. A good number of us are scrambling for the stuff of God. We don't want to have anything to do with God. David is negotiating for God. For his presence. Because without his presence, he can do nothing. And that is the theme for this year. Uh, the book of Acts 10 38 how God anointed Jesus if you want to figure out how Jesus was able to do the things he did understand that scripture in Acts 10 verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth he was a simple carpenter's son who went about doing good 
Bible says he was anointed with the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And what? With power. Who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. So real change, God using you for change in the community begins with your baptism of the presence. Your baptism with the Holy Spirit. You embracing the presence of the Lord. That is where true change comes. So a good number of us spend all our days seeking for God's staff and don't want to have the God of the staff. That is all we want. We do 40 hours. I, I, was, I was just watching and I was talking to somebody that said, you know what, I'm going through stuff. And so even though I'm a leader in a church, I can't lead prayer anymore. I said, you're going through stuff, so you can't lead prayer anymore. I said, do you still go to work? Oh, yeah, I go to work. Oh, but you can go to work and take care of stuff and do five days a week, 40 hours a week, but you can't come to church and lead God's people in 15 minutes of prayer. You go to work five days a week, you're not too depressed to do your work. You're not too depressed to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. You're not so depressed to do none of those. You are perfectly going about your business. What Bible are you reading? Does your Bible say seek ye first or seek ye last? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not going to work five days a week, eight hours each time. And even asking, do you guys have over time? I want time and a half. Oh, pastor, you should be closing that sermon. We've been in a building for almost two hours. Really? But you want overtime after eight hours? I hope this helps somebody. Because you don't understand why things are not changing in your life. You don't understand why you chasing after money. Can't find that money that says in God we trust. It's boldly written on the American dollar. In God we trust. But we trust in the paper rather than the God of the paper. We would do anything to get it. Folks will kill. Folks will lie. Folks will malign. Folks will do anything just to get a bunch of those bills. But look at the heart of this man here. He said, restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Because he understood that if I have all these things and do not have the God, who is the source? And that is where we get wrong. We don't realize that all these people God places in our life to become places where God channels his supplies to us are never the source. They are his source. God is the ultimate source. And so all the glory must not go to any of these people but God. Look at verse number 13. Let's finish this up here. He says, God, when you give me this impact, this encounter, it will now give me the opportunity to go out there and tell the community how God is able to deliver. Remember what we spoke about last week. You can never impact your community without a personal impact. You cannot bring a revival to any group of people when you have not been revived. You can never. You know, I was reading about one of the revivalists, Charles Finnan. Charles Finnan was originally a lawyer. And he was studying the American law. And he realized that everything written in the law of America has a basis in the Bible. So anytime time he would study any law at law school, he would go back and request for a Bible to read how they got this law. And he was studying all these things not because he wanted to learn about God. He wanted to use it as a basis for argument. Charles Finney. Charles Finney came up upstate New York in the 18th century. And any time he would come into any community, every machine that was working stopped because of the presence he carried. And everybody was, what is going on? It got to a time that any time any factory's machine stopped, they said Charles Finney should be in this area. Community impact. You carry something that will cause people to seek after that which you carry, which is the presence of God. Just fitting. A revivalist. And the reason is because he dared to have an impact. I read a story about how 
A young man was in the choir. He was the keyboardist. And he will play and argue all day because he was not born again. Today in the church of Jesus Christ, we have all kinds of islands. No wonder we can't get the presence of God again. Like the day of Solomon's temple dedication where Bible says smoke filled the temple. So now we have machines on the stage. Whilst we are worshiping, it will blow some smoke. Hey, glory, glory. That's the only presence we have, smoke from machines. Because we're not ready for a real move of the spirit. Bible says when that presence entered our room, nobody could stand to minister. The ushers couldn't stand to usher. The ministers couldn't stand to minister. The singers couldn't stand to sing. Because the real presence of God, not the one from machines, came out. The real presence. He says, when you give me this impact, like the woman at the well, when I get this impact, I will go to the community and bring the whole community to the well. That is how revival starts. When you have, first of all, had an impact. And that impact is not going to come until, until we get rid of sin from our hearts. And that is all David is trying to do in this scripture. He says, then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. All these kids smoking electronic cigarettes, hookers, smoking weed, all of them in a community. And we are walking around not bothered. We are like, well, they could, they could waste their life, but get ready, it's coming home. The only reason why you think you're exempted is because your kids are so smart. Yesterday, I watched a little kid sitting at a table studying and a dress hanging on the side of his door. He was sitting next to the door. And he had his cell phone. There was a cloth around the side of the door. And he had a rope tied to his cell phone. And so anytime you open the door, the cell phone went up and got hidden in the clothes. Anytime you close the door, the cell phone came down. Because every five minutes, the mom will come and check whether he's steady. So the moment the mother opens the door, the cell phone vanishes into the clothes. The moment the mother closes the door, the cell phone comes down and he's watching. He wasn't steady. I'm talking about the trickery. How sophisticated this generation has become. So you think that they are so perfect. They're so good. So what is going on in the community has nothing to do with me. Bible says whilst men slept, the enemy so tears. So whilst you are sleeping with regards to prayer, there are seeds that are being sown. Whilst you are sleeping, when you ought to be interceding, praying on your knees, asking God for a move, asking God for a revival. The enemy is sowing tears. And I tell you, those tears are going to grow. They grow. They're going to show up in a school system. They show up in a community. It's going to show up in their hangout places. And it's only a matter of time. Bible says that those we hang out have power to influence us. Look at what it says in verse 14. Because God wants us to go into the community. That is our assignment for this year. Impacting communities. Can you give me the next verse? Technology. Praise God. All right. I want to share one more scripture and then we'll be out of this place. Did you get it? Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. 16, I'm reading all the way to 17. Let's go. Again. You do not want a sacrifice. I would have given it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. I would have given that as well. The sacrifice pleasing to God. Take note of that. He says this is what God truly wants. A broken spirit. <laughs> what God truly wants is not what you bring to church. I'm the biggest tither. I'm the biggest when it comes to offering. All those things are good, but that is not what God ultimately wants. He wants your heart. He wants your spirit to be right with him. He wants a broken spirit. God will not despise a broken spirit and a humbled heart. That is what God truly wants. That becomes a place of revival, a place of awakening, where your heart is cleansed and ready to be used by the Lord. Look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at a prophetic statement Paul gives his son Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's read just the first five verses, and we'll bring this whole thing to an end. You should know this, 
It says you should know this. Did you see that? He said, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be a very difficult times. For people will love only, only what? Themselves. Is that true? He says in the last days, folks are going to be self-centered. And not only that, they will also love their money. No, two hours in church is too much. I got to make money. This is a prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. He says in the last days, people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. And that was what I was talking about. The presence of God is no longer sacred. We, we think we could do other things whilst the presence of the Lord is here with us. They will be unloving and unforgiving. I look at how uh, uh, five black men will beat another black man to death. It is just prophecy being fulfilled. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. Anything they want to do, they do it. They will be cruel. We haven't seen anything else. If you read all the prophecies in the book of Revelation and Ezekiel, you would realize that it will be so terrible at the battle of Armageddon. I've done a whole teaching on the end times. But Bible is giving us a glimpse of the future that is to come. He said they will be cruel. And hate what is good. I look at all the murders going on in our nation today. Murder is on the rise. Murder. A man will kill his wife and children. It's happening all day. And a lot of them are doing it just because they want money. I was watching a documentary of a lady. who is. I believe the lady was in her 70s. She's been married for about 35 years or so. You know what the lady did? She did something that you couldn't even imagine. They had about eight life insurance and they had about 400,000 in equity in their building. Long story short, he killed the husband. And the only reason why she killed the husband is because it's her dream to travel the world before she dies. So I want the money and you're sticking around for too long. You got to go so that my dream is fulfilled. Kills the man. Bible says it right here. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious. But will reject the power that could make them godly. They stay away from people. He said, you got to stay away from people like that. They act religious. You know how we come to church, the way we even dress the way we walk, sanctimonious. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even the tone of our voice. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Your Lord has about three R in it. Lord. They act religious, but the power that will really make them godly, they walk away from it. They don't want to have an encounter with a power that truly makes them godly. This morning our prayer is like the prayer of David. Lord, any sin in my heart. And you see, you cannot repent of your sin until you call it the way God calls it. God calls it sin, you don't say my bad. God calls it sin, you don't call it I blew it. Call it the way God calls it. That shows that you accept responsibility. You agree with the fact that you are not walking in a place God wants you to walk. And you are desperate for change. You want God to come in. You want God to give you true repentance in your heart. You are yearning for the move of the spirit. You want to change in your life. We got to be tired of sin. We got to be tired 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the desires of the enemy. If we truly want to see the hand of God, God is waiting on you to change, turn around so he could fill you with power like the day of Pentecost so that we can go into the community and bring true transformation. That is the assignment. I tell you that anytime we come to this building, the assignment is just one, just to honor God through our worship. But ultimately, God wants us to have character adjustment. All these great things we are seeing around will put us up there. That is what the anointing does. The anointing is attractive. It puts you up there. But what is anointing without character? Today in the pulpit, there is so much fogginess. So much fog in the pulpit. No wonder the pews are filled with mist. People that are confused because the truth of the word is not being preached. Why don't you rise up on your feet? And you could join us if you're on Facebook and Zoom and YouTube. You could join us. Revival is coming back to the house of God. God is bringing a turn around to the community. He's counting on the remnants, the few. He doesn't need a bunch of people. Few people that are willing like David to recognize where we got it wrong and come back in alignment with the word of God. Wherever you are, lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, cleanse my heart. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, give me a turn around. Lord, give me a new page that I may start all over again. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, wash me. Lord, fill me now with your spirit Lord I'm ready use me Lord I'm ready Lord use me for community impact in the name of Jesus now I want you to take a minute open your mouth and speak to him now you know what you are dealing with speak to him now speak to him his ears are open unto the cry of the righteous speak to him oh yes yeah, speak to him tell him what you are going through when you missed it, speak to him and ask him to come into your life afresh. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Lord, give us a turn around. Lord, give us a turn around. Lord, give us a change. A change in our heart and in our spirit. In the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, feel us. Feel us. In the name of Jesus. Lord, feel us with your power. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that convicts our hearts. We thank you for pouring afresh in our hearts and giving us a fresh start. In the name of Jesus, amen. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. Oh, come on, let's put our hands together for him all over this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. God bless you. Take your seat for a minute. We're going to come to the presence of the Lord with our tithe, our offering, our first fruit. Somebody would say, what is first fruit? Is the first seed God puts in your hands. You need an offering envelope, so you can lift your hands. Those of you on Facebook, Zoom, RV fam, on the screen right now, you're going to see how you could also sow your seed virtually. And you could sow using Zelle, using Cash App, and using PayPal. And the tag is LegacySow at gmail.com. LegacySow at gmail.com. That come. And so let's take our seed as we prepare to sow your tithe. In case you have dementia when it comes to tithe, tithe simply means 10% of whatever God gives you. So don't have dementia about that. It's a covenant relationship. Yesterday I was with a, a good friend of mine in Poughkeepsie and he said, Apostle, you know what? The Lord spoke to me. They had just bought a new building in Poughkeepsie and I visited him and we were having fellowship. And he said, Apostle, you know what? God just convicted my heart. And for, from last year, he said, I began tithing at 30%. I said, how are you able to do that? 
He said, you know what? I went to see a man of God uh, in Venezuela. This was his exact testimony. And he says Venezuela is going through a, all kinds of economic challenges. And this man of God has the biggest church over there. And the man of God challenged him because the man owns a whole island. He brought him to that island. He had a, this elaborate story. But long story short, <clears throat> this man he encountered in Venezuela has been so much blessed by God. And the only reason he said God has continued to bless him is because he has been living off 30% of his income and giving 70% to the work of God. And he told himself, if this man is living off 30% and God has blessed him that much, then I got to do more. So he came back and he said, from that time, I decided to give God 30% and live off 70 I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm just telling you the power of giving. Bible says clearly that when you give, you receive. Amen. It's a kingdom principle. And so I, I encourage you and challenge you to walk in that spirit of giving. That as you give, God will continue to pour into your life. I speak over your seed right now. If you are sowing, I speak over that seed. You are giving, whether digitally you are giving, you are giving in a building. I speak God's blessings over your seed. I speak his blessings over your first fruit, over your tithe, over your offering. Every seed you are giving today, I pray that the blessing of giving will come upon you. I pray that God will multiply your seed sown. He will cause your harvest to be pressed down, shaking together and even running over. He will cause men to pour into your bosom. And I pray that God will rebuke every spirit that seeks to devour. And God will protect you by pouring even into your life through the windows of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you as you sow your seed. Amen. A few announcements before we get to the lower level for lunch. Um, don't forget. Tomorrow, as always, we start a week with prayer. The time, 6 o'clock. I encourage you to join us in a time of prayer. And on Monday, Legacy Ladies will be on Zoom. The time is 8 o'clock. Please, ladies, let's get on and uh, engage. It's a powerful time. Wednesday will be the concluding part of the new series we've been studying on the book of Acts. I encourage you to join me. The time is 7.30. And then, of course, on Friday, we are back together with prayer at 7.30. I tell you, every last Friday of the month, we're going to be in a building. How many of you were blessed last Friday? Man, we had such a powerful time here in the building. And I encourage you, our next service is going to be the last Friday of February. Don't miss it. It was such a powerful time. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, don't forget Sunday, we're going to have our joint service. Our Bronx campus is going to be here and it's going to be an exciting time. It is going to be a time of communion and coming to the Lord's table. So don't forget that as well. Saturday, if you are part of Legacy Life University, our class will be on. And so don't miss it. 9 a.m. is the class. Amen. Did I forget anything? I did announce that. Did I? Saturday morning, 6 o'clock. I think I did Monday. Saturday morning, 6 a.m. We have prayer as well. So please join us. It's going to be on Zoom. I'm sorry? Love Connect is coming up this um, February 25th. Please lock it in. February 25th. It's going to be our relationship seminar. If you are married, come with your spouse. If you are dating, come with your date. Whatever relationship you have, please come to this event. We have uh, great couples that are coming in to teach us about relationship. And of course, March 25th is going to be the graduation for Legacy Life University. If you've taken any course with us, it is going to be a beautiful day to show up and be honored with your certificate. Amen. We never finish our service without introducing those that are worshiping with us for the very first time. We have a beautiful lady in the house who came to bless our children and youth ministry. And uh, she came with two other people. We are truly honored to have you. Let, let's celebrate them. Let's put our hands together. Come on, let's, let's give them a love legacy. Welcome. And let us bring them the first time visitors 
information. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amen. We are truly honored and blessed. I tell you, it's been almost three weeks in waiting. We've been waiting for your arrival. <laughs> but thank you for coming today. We are truly blessed and honored. I wish I was in the children's department, the youth department, to hear the good stuff you brought to them. And uh, I, can, I can tell they, they have been blessed by what you brought to them. So I want to say thank you to all of you. And uh, I believe this is just going to be the beginning of many times we're going to spend together. Amen. God bless you once again. Let's put our hands together for them. Well, today I'm also excited because our sister Marie is in the house. And our brother Isaac is here. <laughs> we miss you guys. It's good to have you back home. Amen. The last time we spoke, Sister Marie said, I can't wait to be in church. I'm tired. I'm tired of being home. I'm coming to church. Amen. We bless God. We bless God. Well, God bless your family. As always, we have a bunch of food at the lower level, all for free. Don't you love that? Bunch of food, bunch of beverage. We have coffee. Shamo, me and you, coffee. We're going to go have our coffee and enjoy good times of fellowship. Amen. God bless you. Let's rise up as we share the grace. Family on Facebook, we love you guys. It's always a blessing to have you connect to us. We love you and can't wait to have you in the next meeting. Amen. Let's share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless your family. Love you.